We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Hi, I'm Jessica Thompson, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Yale University. I'm the PI of the Paleoarchaeology Lab, where we investigate the archaeology of our origins. We also do a lot of paleoenvironmental work in the lab. And today I'm going to combine those two themes to talk about the human transformation as we went from environmental managers to environmental damagers. I'm going to sort of frame a lot of this talk around this issue of fire. Fire is really the ultimate human tool. We are the only animals that use fire in the same way that we are able to make it and we're able to produce it and we're able to transfer it. Other animals might use it. They might take it from place to place, like these fire hawks in Australia, but it's really only humans that have been able to harness the power of fire and use it as a transformative tool in our lives of our ancestors, as well as the ways in which we've been able to change the world around us. So just kind of starting with how it was that we began using fire, our earliest ancestors who first were able to do this most likely used it for cooking. At least this would have been a primary purpose. We know that this is a really useful thing to do because it can unlock the nutrient density of foods in a way that you just can't do otherwise. When you have more nutrients from the same foods, you have more fuel. When you have more fuel, more energy, you're able to relax some of those evolutionary constraints on things like brain size, for example, which is a very expensive organ. It requires a lot of energy. If you have the ability to gain more energy from your diet, then you don't necessarily have to limit the amount of energy that goes into feeding that big brain. Of course, we know that humans are very smart in, as far as animals go. That has been helpful to us as well. And you can imagine this as this sort of recursive cycle in which the larger brains helped us to do even more transformative things to the world around us. We imagine also that fire was a very important tool for the transformation of human societies. There are data on this. It shows that hunter-gatherers, they spend a lot more time sitting around fires talking about different sorts of things, especially social things, than what they do in their normal day-to-day -day activities. By extending the daylight hours, Fire was able to give humans and early human groups the opportunity to spend that time making those social connections and telling those stories. And that has been an important transformative aspect of how it is that we engage with one another cooperatively. We also know that early humans used fire as a transformation of materials. There are certain types of stone that just perform better and make better tools after they have been heated in a very particular way. A lot of humans like to use red pigments to color things like their clothing or their bodies. And we can transform yellow natural earth pigments into red natural earth pigments through the use of fire. These are things that humans have been doing for hundreds of thousands of years. And they have been instrumental in our ability to kind of start to shape the world around us. But what about when we move beyond those objects that are right in front of us, the food, the tools, the paint, and we think more about kind of shaping the environment. Is this something that early humans were able to do? 
What I've got here is a map showing you some uh, numbers, and the numbers represent the earliest time in thousands of years for which we have evidence currently of what we might call a, a climate anomaly. So this is where you see a change in the vegetation, which represents the environment. And the vegetation was changing in a way that is out of sync with what you would expect to have happened um, based on climate alone. So an explanation might be that you have humans intervening in that environment in a way that is altering the vegetation and that you can't just explain those changes on the basis of things like temperature and precipitation. So these numbers are definitely going to be minimum numbers. This is only an area of research that is fairly new. And it's exciting to be able to think about how it is that we can find new ways to uncover evidence for the earliest ways in which humans were beginning to manage, shape, and transform their environments around them. You'll also, if you're familiar with the dispersal of modern humans, probably imagine that this map looks pretty familiar to you because it roughly does follow the spread of modern humans too, earliest in Africa, and then spreading out into the rest of the world. So fire has been along with us on that entire journey, and it has been leaving behind a legacy, maybe a, a trail of fire, that is, is really kind of the hallmark of how humans engage with their environments. And that is to say, we change them. So this is not new. Humans changing their environments is something that we have done since we have been human. And then the real question is, what are the consequences of that? And are there ways to do this sustainably? So here's some research that I've been fortunate to be able to, to uh, participate in, and in fact lead. And this is in Central Africa in Malawi. And I'm just gonna show you a graph here from something we published recently that illustrates this point of the climate anomaly. So you have the blue background and the darker blue represents periods of time when there was more rainfall. When you have more rainfall, you tend to have more trees. When you have less rainfall, the lighter blue, you tend to have more grass. Here we have another part of the graph, which is separate from both of those, in which you have high rainfall, dark blue, but you also have high grass. So what we're seeing is that after 85,000 years ago in this particular part of Africa, in this case study, we go from a situation in which wet periods equal more trees to a situation in which the wet period still resulted in open vegetation, more grass. What's maintaining that open vegetation even though you have enough rainfall to sustain tree cover? We suspect that it's humans, that humans are coming into the area in a way that is representing a new kind of use of fire. And in so doing, they're transforming that vegetation. So here's a graphic that kind of illustrates what might have happened. You have high lake levels around 100,000 years ago. And this is something you might think of as sort of the natural state. Then you have a naturally occurring climate change in which the basin becomes very arid. And after that, rainfall returns. However, even though the rainfall has come back in a way that is able to sustain high levels of tree cover, you don't have the trees returning to the same extent that they did during previous natural regimes. In this case, you have humans coming in with their tools, with fire, and they are burning portions of that vegetation in order to create habitats that help them to be able to hunt game. The new grass will attract new game into the area and you create these sort of mosaic habitats around the region so that you can go to the forest, you can go to the edge of the forest, you can go to the open grassland, and you don't have to travel long distances in order to access the resources that are available in each of those habitats. And that's the power of fire that you can actually use to modify the vegetation selectively, not indiscriminately, in order to sort of suit your needs. So we think we have very early evidence for this in Central Africa, which is a very sophisticated use of fire. And the result is that you have an entirely different erosion regime that, that comes about as a consequence of this. So with this increased burning of vegetation and this increased openness of the landscape, you also have that now anomalously occurring at the same time as quite a bit of rainfall. And the result is a shift in how much erosion can occur. So we suspect that not just the ancient vegetation, 
but the actual present-day landscape is entirely shaped by Stone Age humans. This is one case study that kind of shows us how you can have a situation where as humans become more and more involved in shaping their environments, you also have a series of tipping points that are crossed. These are thresholds after which it's very difficult to go back to the prior state. And it kind of starts to make me think about landscapes and environments as the product of human environment legacies, not necessarily an artificial divide between Stone Age people who were living um, kind of at the whim of their environment. And then after that, you have people who are practicing food production like agriculture and they're controlling their environment, but rather thinking of this as a continuum and a long-term trajectory in which the scene was really set by our earliest ancestors to transform and control the world around us. And it's at that point that you start to see the most intensive forms of land use of all, and that is food production. The path to food production occurred in many different parts of the world at many different times and in many different environmental contexts, but had similar consequences. They were all built on a legacy, however, of prior land use by hunter-gatherers, and hunter-gatherers had at their fingertips the use of fire that they could use to shape the environment that they were living in. So the pathway to food production represents something that was fairly quick in the overall picture of the way that humans have developed their technologies over time. And what it has done is it has fundamentally changed the relationship that humans have with their environments. So we can think of food production as an extension of this wild resource management and intensification that hunter-gatherers were already using, particularly through tools like fire. And then you have a point in time when people begin to take even greater degrees of control over their environments, particularly through domestication. So the domestication of animals and plants is when you start to make them rely on you in order to be able to reproduce. And then they also become more productive for humans. So it's, it's sort of a step above in terms of the intensity, what it is that hunter-gatherers were doing. And agriculture and pastoralism are the primary forms of food production. Not all of these are unsustainable. Horticulture, small-scale small gardening is quite sustainable under the right circumstances. Pastoralism, it seems, was even one of the ways in which some of these early savanna ecosystems developed some of their really nutrient-rich areas. So, for example, there has been archaeological and paleoenvironmental research that shows that some of these iconic savannas, like the Serengeti, have dense nutrient patches that attract animals. The animals are, of course, what the tourists come to see. And then these so-called natural ecosystems are actually shaped upon a legacy of human pastoralism and livestock keeping, because where humans were keeping their animals and they dropped the dung, that enriched particular areas that now today draw in the wild animals. So all of this is connected in ways that were not fully understood and started, until we started to pay more attention to the paleo-environmental and archeological records. We also, if we start to look there in those records, see that there is an extreme sort of stepping up in the extent to which humans are starting to use fire as this transformative tool. So there's this sort of million year long legacy of hominin and then later modern human fire use in really innovative and important ways. But in the last 25,000 years or so, you start to see a shift, not just into kind of changing the properties of materials and, um, and changing pieces of the environment, but also thinking about how you can transform something from one thing into another thing. One of these types of technologies is ceramic technology, for example, pottery, which uh, was actually in its first use decorative rather than functional in terms of pots. But what we see is with the advent of metallurgy, you have a true transformative technology, in which case you are not just changing kind of the material properties of a particular type of resource, but you're actually making a whole new type of resource out of raw materials that you're combining together in really, truly innovative ways. And with this comes a big increase in the scale of human extraction, and of course, the need to power that extraction through fuel. And in this case of iron smelting, this would be things like charcoal and wood burning and clearing and deforestation that can come with that. So we can't just blame agriculture, even though 
a lot of the very earliest agricultural tools um, were made of iron. But we do see a relationship between these things. When you start to move beyond the more hunter-gatherer model of sustainable land use and targeted burning that is designed to create mosaic landscapes, and you start to move into the human need for more and more land to fulfill their needs for fuel, to fulfill their needs for population centers and for food through agriculture, then you start to see a big change in the relationship between humans and their environments. And the change has been quite sudden. When you look at the long-term archeological and paleoenvironmental record, it's quick. Here's Northern Malawi today, and you can see that it's a fairly anthropogenic looking landscape. There's a lot going on here that has a human imprint. And when we actually look at the very recent part of this time period, so no longer studying the Stone Age, but now moving forward in time, we can see that there's been an enormous amount of erosion in this particular area where I do my research over the last thousand years or so. And we can relate this to human land use practices and the advent of agriculture into the area in a really more intensive way than had previously been there. So what archeology span really reveals is changes in the timing and the scale of these tipping points. We know that humans have long been involved in shaping and managing and transforming environments, but we see that in the last thousand years or so, we're really seeing a ramping up at a scale that is completely unprecedented. And in the last 400 years, even more so. So the human story is certainly one of transformation, but we have to ask ourselves, how many more of these tipping points can we actually tolerate in a sustainable way? We know that hunter-gatherers were able to live for hundreds of thousands of years sustainably using transformative tools embedded within their ecosystems and recursively interacting with them. But what are we doing now with this really intensive agriculture and these massive changes in erosion and land use? One of the things that archaeologists have started to pay a lot more attention to is this concept of how it is that we can use the tools available to us to understand what is, what is kind of not true about the natural world. In other words, are there really a lot of natural places left in the world and how long have they been natural? What we find is that the majority of terrestrial environments are shaped by people and have been shaped by people for a very, very long time and I mean thousands of years. So we're not talking about the current situation where we have extensive land degradation and erosion and so on as the consequence of humans coming into an untouched wilderness and then changing it. What we're seeing is a different type of use of land that was already under heavy human influence, but in a much more sustainable way in the past, being transformed into a much less sustainable way in the present. And one of the things that we can start to think about is how we might learn from that. And when we think about going forward, how is it that we can try to use the lessons from the archeological and paleoenvironmental records to think about ways that we can, we can do it more sustainably in the future? And one of the things that I just wanna point out here is that there are a lot of natural places that again, have not actually been natural places, as in completely untouched by humans, really ever. And the Serengeti ecosystem is a nice example here, because we know that herders have lived there for a very long time, and the archaeological record shows that humans have lived there for as long as humans have been around. So how is it that they were able to sustainably live in those environments so much then? And then how can we maybe model that going forward so that we don't have this kind of conflict between humans and environments, but rather we think about ways that the two can coexist together. And this kind of leads us to the question of what do we do about it? So we're here, this is the point where we are, and we know that it's very difficult to go past into uh, beyond a, a tipping point and actually bring back the past. But what can we do going forward that might be more sustainable? One of the things I think we really need to do more of is think about the tools that are available to us from archaeology and from paleoenvironmental science so that we can really look at the long term picture of how all of this came about and maybe predict what's going to happen going forward. We have to start recognizing that it's probably a fallacy to imagine that there are 
um, natural places and unnatural places and a hard divide between the two. The reality is humans have been transforming their landscape everywhere they have been. Their environments have changed everywhere they have gone. And that's been happening for hundreds of thousands of years. So in light of that, how can we more creatively think about models that can allow that kind of legacy to continue, but in a more sustainable way? And to do that, it's going to require that we think carefully about the equitable distribution of the kinds of tools, the resources, and the knowledge that we're going to need as a society, as a global society, in order to be able to get there. We know that there are not equal distributions of all of these things globally. A lot of the research that we would like to do needs to be able to be done in collaboration with indigenous stakeholders and with local collaborators in a way that meaningfully takes advantage of the knowledge that they have about the world where they live locally and how it kind of connects to the larger picture when we think about the loss of biodiversity, for example. So these are the sorts of ways in which we might have to reimagine the way we just approach the problem. I think looking at the long-term record of human transformation and using the example of fire is a good way to start. And that can help us as we try to picture a future that is a lot more sustainable than what we have recently seen. So I just wanted to quickly thank all my many collaborators in developing that work in Malawi, and also to thank you for coming here today, for listening to this talk, and for being so engaged with trying to learn more about the human role in environments and the kind of legacy that we have as the planet altering apes. <laughs>